Next session really is about robots um, and moving from the artificial intelligence to the real technology that no doubt is using artificial intelligence. So at home I do have one of those Roomba that does the cleaning and goes around and hits the wall and turns around. So that's one of them. Uh, there's Sophia, who's the first robot who's got citizenship in Saudi Arabia. And so all of this brings all sorts of new debates and questions. So I'd like to invite on stage Rory Keth Land Jones, who's a BBC. No? Did I get it right? Yeah, it's pretty good. For a French man, it's yeah. sort of, you know, <laughs> as, as pas mal, as good as it gets. Uh, who's the BBC News Technology Correspondent since 2007. So please come on stage. And I'll invite the two panelists as well who you will be introducing, no doubt. So this is Beth Singler and. Sang Sok Yu? Pretty good. Pretty good as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi, everybody. What a crowd. I think I can see you. Any of you robots tonight? No robots. No robots here. Um, um, we are set for a fascinating, just under an hour, discussion about... Uh, what we think of robots, what, what it's like living with robots, uh, humanoid robots, um, uh, robots that live in factories, robots that want to come into your home and look after you, uh, robot dogs that think they're real dogs but aren't. Um, uh, we're going to cover a wide field here. Uh, I've got a home full of robots, I was just working out. Uh, I've got um, uh, four called Alexa who uh, pipes up from time to time. I've got a, about three called Google Home, who also intervenes from, uh, every now and then. And uh, I've got a washing machine and a dishwasher, which when you think about it, are sort of robots. So I think we'll be partly talking about the definition of robots, but we're gonna get ourselves going with a fantastic uh, contribution from students from Wimbledon High School. Who's, who's, who's playing the music? It's great, I'm li liking it. I love a musical accompaniment. Um, so, uh, can I invite the students from Wimbledon High School uh, up onto the stage um, and uh, tell us, to tell us about a project they have been undertaking? Give them a, give them a, give them a big hand. Over the past term, we have been experimenting with how to use them, and we were interested in how people interacted with them in their day-to-day -day life. In our research, we found a really interesting article about how robots are being used in railway stations already in France. This is an example of how AI is being introduced to our daily lives. We were so curious about this idea that we wanted to compare this to the school environment. When we first introduced the robots, people found them very unfamiliar and started off by avoiding them. After we explained what they were, they treated them as a pet or a toy. However, we wanted to investigate whether we would be able to work alongside them in a school or work environment. We created this video to try and communicate our findings. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. Let's see the video. Do you feel any connection with this robot? I do because it keeps looking back to me and kind of waiting for me to say hello. So it's very sweet. Originally, I actually didn't think that I would have such a strong connection to something that is effectively just programmed and coded by someone. But it feels like a person. I don't know why, but that's just how.
How might these robots affect our future? It, they'll be very helpful for, for the students and for all of us, I think, going forward, definitely. I'm sure like, they'll help, but in like a jobs point of view, they're going to take away lots of jobs from other people that, you know, can't qualify to get other jobs and they're needed, and it'll be really sad. Would you replace working people with robots? No, I wouldn't, because I think that um, people can have empathy, and I don't think you necessarily have that from a robot completely, but I do think they do have their place, but not necessarily replace them. The robots are more accurate, they can be programmed, which is also going to um, create some jobs. Thank you very much. Great stuff, great stuff. Um, well, we've got two great guests here. Uh, we've got Beth Singler from Cambridge University, who is uh, an anthropologist by training uh, and uh, works uh, uh, on, uh, uh, as a junior research fellow on, on AI. Uh, and uh, Sang Sok Yu, who uh, is uh, uh, teaching at uh, the HEC Business School in Paris uh, and is an expert on human-robot interaction. Um, we're we're going to kick off with, with Beth. Uh, uh, with, with that film as a starting point, because that kind of talks to, to, to some of what you've been thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, first of all, want to say what an absolutely fantastic film that was. Just wonderfully clear and succinct, but also very good at capturing some of the very intuitive reactions people have to robots. So the very first person featured on that film, I don't know if you noticed, it's actually something like scritching. It's a, mm -hmm. I don't know if people know this word, scritching, scratching. Uh, the, the robot that's sort of shaped somewhere between a rabbit and a dog. And there's that sort of reaction to it being almost animalistic and like drawing into his conception of, of the wider world. That's very, you've got like sort of an anthropological eye there in the film that I think is fantastic, but also you've got those, these are my slides coming up, but you've got, you've got the detail of people's reaction to them and the summary of the things that we should be thinking about in, in a very short space of time. I think from a filmmaking perspective, it was absolutely excellent as well. So I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna carry on and talk about human reactions to robots, which as an anthropologist, the thing that I'm very, very, very interested in. I, I like to summarize my work sometimes by saying, I think about what you think about the machines that might think. Uh, there's a lot of mites and maybes in there, but we already have, as we have in this, this slide, so many different images of what the robot could and should be. So I'd like to start, I mean, you can see top on the, my top right, your top left, uh, an article there, slightly more dystopic, uh, from the uh, Daily Star about the end of the world. And uh, I like this one because they've combined not only the, the standard Terminator imagery, but they've managed to get some robot boobs in there again. And I will return to those in a moment. But uh, this is an image they've actually specifically created for this article. But often we get quite banal articles about the progress of AI, but still illustrated with the Terminator and the end of the world. And then uh, my favorite example of what I'm going to call robo-splaining, uh, top middle, <laughs> where the future will involve uh, male-looking android robots telling women what to do on computers. <laughs> I quite like that. I mean, there's absolutely no reason why there should be an android informing you. You could just have on the computer screen, you've done something wrong, kind of, you know, a modern version of Clippy. Uh, but this is, this is how we're illustrating. I mean, I, I think she's superbly glamorous as well for what she's up to, but this is, this is the imagery that we get. And then the kind of standard, as mentioned in the film, the idea about the automation of work, the future of the robot coming along and taking your job away from you. This Again, there's no reason why this should be an anthropomorphic robot, but this is how we imagine these things. I mean, the, the, the larger picture includes more people working away and more robots coming in. And then, and then the cute robot. I mean, adorable. It's even blushing. 
It's wonderful, but this is, this is, and I will talk about this a little bit more, about how the design of robots hacks our emotions. So we have a tendency towards anthropomorphization anyway. It takes very, very little for us to start considering robots as a part of our wider cosmology of beings. But when you make them cute and small, it helps. Um, sorry, I have to keep dashing around to look where I'm, I'm pointing at. Sorry, I did promise more robot boobs. We, we, we're in the later hours, and I know there are school children around, but we can probably still mention the fact that a lot of our imaginations of the robot future involve sexy lady robots. Um, and then, of course, the dream, the aspiration, the robot, for me, certainly, that will come over my house. Uh, that, again, no reason why there should be a human-shaped robot to do this. We have already the conception of the Roomba, but this is the, the vacuum-cleaning robot that's going to come along. But none of, none of these ideas are particularly new. This is what I'm very interested in, that although the term artificial intelligence doesn't really date back prior to 1956 in a particular conference, we've had these ideas of servant artificial beings for a very long time. So if this works, the magic of technology, here we go. So Aristotle, who also turned up in your wonderful film with the Aristotelian definition of friendship, Aristotle also imagined a future where our tools would be able to do their tasks without human intervention. So she, he saw this as freeing up both the masters and the slaves to a life of leisure, quite possibly, and the tool would be the artificial being. Um, but more recently, um, this carries on. Um, the concept of artificial slaves is a, a kind of a through line in some of this discussion, and, and some people take this further and start discussing, uh, or prematurely, surely, the, the idea of robot rights. But here, an article from the 1950s predicting uh, that by the 1960s, mid 1960s, slavery will be back, it says, but don't worry, because there'll be robots. That there will actually be a time in which we will have robot slaves, and the language all the way through this article, I know it's, it's particularly difficult to read, but all the language does restore some of the imagery, the harsh and dangerous imagery of slavery of African Americans. So actually one of the robots is called Jingles, which comes from Bojangles, which was one of the terrible nicknames given to African American slaves. So this, this line kind of follows through, and we've had this concept of the robot servant for a very long time. Uh, we, we also imagine this in very beneficial ways. So this is an example here of a, a robot in the care situation. Um, and for certain societies, we're increasingly aware of how much we have an elderly population, an aging population, uh, demands on our healthcare service that cannot entirely be met, met by humans. And the suggestion being that robots, and this is a gif, I'll just keep repeating, um, that robots might be the solution to this, but I'm not entirely sure I want to be bathed by robots. So there's questions there about human dignity and how we interact with people when they, they reach a stage of needing care. Uh, you may have come across this robotic, uh, again, animal-esque robots. This is Paro, uh, famous more perhaps in Japan. This is a, a GIF again from uh, Japanese culture. They're, they're looking at using Paro as a sort of a, a form of emotional labor in care situations that this might be beneficial to people who uh, don't have as much interaction with humans. But again, the same sorts of questions, like what does this do to human dignity that we are more interacting with synthetic life forms than actual human beings? Is it gonna move on? And this is uh, an example, again, the animal theme keeps running through our interpretation of robots and what, uh, what makes them appealing. So these are two uh, robot things, they're called Kubo, uh, from the recent CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas from this year. And you can get them in two different colors. And all they basically do is, is their tails move and wag. And the advertising for this is all around, it's a Japanese country, this uh, uh, company, this idea that perhaps you don't have space or the availability of a pet, but you could have this cushion with a wagging tail. <laughs> And there's a whole a kind of range of questions about simulation and whether simulation is enough when we can't have the real thing. Does simulation somehow serve a purpose? I find exactly what's known as the Uncanny Valley. You've never come across this idea before from Masahiro Mori in the 1970s. He said you know, that there's a certain space in which... Is this microphone not good? I can hear shouting. I'm good at shouting. Um, We'll get closer and closer to the human, but not close enough. And it gives us this sense of distrust and disgust and the uncanny. 
And actually, I think, to my mind, these sort of fall in there because they're sort of round blobs with just tails. They're not really animalistic enough. They're close, but not close enough. Um, but, you know, science fiction has been utilizing these sorts of uh, adorable characteristics for a long time. I hope you recognize this as Wally from the Disney Pixar film, that he is designed specifically for all his sort of rust and dirt to actually be appealing for being cute and adorable. Um, and you should have some sort of sentimental attachment to him. But this we know very clearly when we sit down to watch the film on DVD or we go to the cinema. We know this is science fiction. This is pretend. Like Wally presents us with the robot with agency and choice, but we know it's science fiction. But some other contemporary forms of robots, it's not so clear when it's fact and when it's fiction. So I call these fake robots phobots. And um, if it moves on, it's going to think about it. There are other examples of phobots where the line between fact and fiction is not so clear. So this is an example of a, a computer-generated image of a robotic form. This is Adam from a Webby series, a Webby award-winning series uh, online. And this was a demonstration that the creators of Adam put on Twitter as an example of what they could do with the Unity games engine. And it's, it's fairly convincing. If I hadn't told an artificial generation of a robot. You might have believed that this was a robot walking up a street, because people did. So of all people, Darren Brown was really taken in by this. Uh, it was denuded of context. The original clip, people lost the original tweet, which said that it was from a CGI creation. And people started sharing it, saying, oh my god, this is an example of an actual robot. And including Darren Brown said things like, we are all going because that line between fact and fiction often gets quite blurred, and without the original context, some people found this disturbing, again, quite un uncanny, to use Masahiro Mori's uh, term. And that line between fact and fiction is something I'm very interested in. One of the things I've been looking at is what I call Wellsian slippage, this moment when uh, robotic forms in particular and our discussion of artificial intelligence slips between truth and fiction. Uh, if you're not familiar with this incident, in 1938, Orson Welles produced a radio play of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. And um, it's, it's debatable quite what the actual impact was, but for, for some people, a small amount of people, perhaps not as many as uh, reported in the press at the time, this was treated as a completely factual occurrence. They heard the radio play, but they didn't realize it was fiction. They didn't realize it was H.G. Wells. And, and people panicked. They missed the adverts. And that line between fact and fiction got blurred. Uh, H, uh, Orson Welles was particularly good at this kind of performance of fiction and fact. And he kind of played on the fact that the new technology of radio enabled this. But I think this is a, a, an interesting historical parallel for some of the responses, such as Darren Brown's, oh my God, we're all going to die, tweet. Responses to fictional accounts of artificial intelligence and robotics that slip into non-fiction. Another example of a phobot that I have a lot of problems with is uh, Sophia, the Hansen robot, who got a bit of a mention at the beginning. She Actually, she didn't get a full citizenship of Saudi Arabia. She got honorary citizenship of Saudi Arabia. Um, and if you, if you see this, this GIF here, she has done many uh, public appearances. She's been on the Jimmy Fallon show. She's been on the front cover of Style magazine. She's had makeovers. And she did, yes, yeah, she went on a date with Will Smith. Um, she turned him down, according to this. You know, she friend-zoned him, not a term I particularly like. But uh, this representation of Sophia, who to all accounts, and I have consulted with chatbot experts, she's very little more than a puppet. There is a certain element of performance to her. Her responses are often scripted. Sometimes her movements are managed by people off screen. There, there is definitely a fictional element to her, but she's presented as a non-fictional account of a, a contemporary advanced robot. As you know, she speaks at the UN and people are said to take attention to her. So I think it's very concerning when these lines between fact and fiction are blurred when we consider what we think the robot is. So when, it's, it, when it comes to imagining the future and this nice idea of the servant robot who's going to do all our tasks for us, we have to be very careful we're not sucked into the fictional account. As in here, this is a very old cartoon. Some of us will recognize it, some of us won't. Uh, from the Jetsons, where 
you know, they, they had the robot maid and they had the servant class robot that could do everything for us. It's actually not going to be very much like that. You might have the Roomba scooting around the room, but it's not going to be the human looking robot pushing the hoover around. What's actually quite concerning is the invisibility of robots and artificial intelligence in our lives. And I think actually the future will be closer to this more abstract illustration of the connectedness of, of uh, technology. And actually we should be concerned about the robots we can't see rather than the ones that we can see. Thank you very much. Beth, thank you very much. Um, just before I, we, we move on, uh, Another great example of Phobots, there was a, a House of Commons committee, mm. uh, select committee, which had uh, a hearing on robots, and they had Pepper, who is an interesting robot, yes. who gave evidence to the committee. Yes. Is, that, is that a... That's a bad thing, isn't it? That That's is... That, yeah, no, I remember that. That's a particularly bad thing, because the, 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 the narrative that comes through that robot is not the decision of the robot. It's the decision of the script writers behind the robot, the creators of the robot, the users of the robot. So if you're trying to source we're, evidence... We're gen generally creating a, a false narrative about mm. the capabilities of these Absolutely. devices and what they're for. And, and to my mind, that distracts us from the actual capabilities mm. of um, machine learning intelligence that can distract us and lead us into a society that we're not prepared for. Yeah. Great. Uh, we're going to debate all these things in a moment, but first we're going we're to hear from Sansok Yu. Uh, now, you're, uh, you're, looking about, uh, you're looking at the the way we uh, we see robots in more in a sort of professional spaces, how mm -hmm. how we interact with them at work in the factory and so on. Right. So, um, can I have the yes. clicker? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. Oh. yeah. Uh, by the way, my presentation is uh, going to be pretty short and concise. Um, I just want to show you a couple of pictures. I think uh, these pictures are around um, like internet uh, pretty while. And you know, I just want to say how we interact with robots are qualitatively different from how we used to interact with uh, other traditional technologies like computers, laptops, and your smartphones, right? So um, imagine um, how you use computers. Like you use keyboard, you use mouse, and then very advanced way you use a VR headset. I mean, that's um, kind of like more advanced way. But um, we are like, interacting with robots by hug them, petting them, touching them, feeding them, like something like that. So this is because robots have like physical bodies. I think this is what makes robots robots, right? But this physical, um, yeah, the one slide is missing actually. Um, I was going to show you um, like a scene from my actual experiment that uh, the participants were uh, interacting with the robot to uh, perform a collaborative task. Um, I used the Lego robots, you know, Mindstorms. Uh, it's pretty simple toy um, assemble, uh, assembled robot. I mean, I, I think it's pretty much like used widely in high schools and then K-12 you know, education uh, or STEM education. Um, I use, I, I build a simple robot. I mean, that doesn't have any like intelligence or um, you know, artificial intelligence and stuff like that. But in the task, the people were asked to move the five water bottles from point A to point B and point C as quickly as possible by controlling those robots. And I found that you know, even with these simplistic robots, the people were uh, pretty much strongly emotionally attached to those robots. Um, for example, you know, before uh, interacting with the robots, they, they call them just it. Like, oh, it is pretty small, it is pretty simple, and then how it can uh, move the water bottle and stuff like that. But after, like, very brief interaction, um, I don't think it lasted, like, more than an hour. I, it's, it, it was, like, a bit less than an hour. Um, after this brief interaction, I, we observed that, like, the people call them um, like he or she. So it's a pretty much like a sheer evidence that you know, the people project personality, uh, intention, values, I mean, those all human-like characteristics to those robots. So, um, you know, this is pretty strong tendency uh, that we have uh, towards these physically embodied objects. And then we can see this like pretty much wide variety of different um, like types of robots. 
Um, you know, that I, I think um, the physical embodiment and then human nature and then human minds toward the robot, that could be uh, pretty much like a good key uh, to solving the problems that we have um, um, about the having the robots in our workplaces. You know, as you can see here, uh, you know, these, the orange box shaped uh, device, um, this is a robot uh, that was deployed to an Amazon warehouse. And then Amazon uh, is actually investing a lot of money and resource to uh, build this kind of robots. And then they um, established the company, Amazon Robotics, and then they sell this robot to, uh, you know, warehouse and the logistics companies. And then, you know, it's pretty cool, right? This small robot can carry around um, like very heavy uh, stuff, They're very effective. And then all this warehouse has uh, little markers so that uh, these robots can navigate, like no collision. It's very effective. And then you can, the, and one warehouse only needs a few people, like this man. I mean, this is a problem for um, for us, especially blue-collar workers, right? So it can drastically reduce the number of people who are necessary for uh, running these warehouses, right? So I would say, you know, there is a growing fear among human workers, especially blue-collar workers, that robots are going to take our jobs, right? I think uh, this photo is pretty much nicely depicting what is happening or what is going to happen in our workplaces, right? So this robot looks pretty grumpy, right? So, um, like, uh, it doesn't like anything, and then it uh, directs this person to go home, and then there are actually people going home, Right? So the people may be uh, directed by a robot, and then they actually have to go home losing their jobs. But, you know, this kind of fear and all sorts of uh, negative feelings towards robots is pretty problematic um, for individual workers and the companies as well. So, for example, this negative attitude towards robots and then these negative feelings um, can lead to um, poor mental well-being and low job performance and then even high turnover rate, right? So it is pretty, like, you know, an important problem for organization to survive. So I think what we have to solve in the future by having robots and adopting robots in our workplaces uh, is to build a cohesive workforce like that um, consists of like both human and the robot. You know, um, a lot of people believe that robots will take our places and then people will be replaced by the robots in the near future. But uh, to be honest, I don't think it's gonna be pretty near future. Maybe it won't happen at all. Um, I think it's going to be more like robots will be working with us. So maybe this kind of fear is not real. Maybe this kind of fear is not going to be realized, but it's actually the fact that, uh, the sheer fact that the blue collar workers are having this fear and um, not so much about these robots are not. So the companies and the researchers have to think about the, how we nicely integrate these robots to our workplaces. And then as a solution for this kind of problem, as I was um, like talking about before, you know, hacking the human minds, and then how we interact with uh, robots, and then how we behave with robots, and then studying about those. Like, this would be pretty much good key to solve this problem. That's pretty much it for my, my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let, I think we've got a definition problem here. Can we agree what is a robot? Mm -hmm. uh, wh how do you define a robot? Um, first of all, I, I should admit that the robots, the term, is very loaded. Um, you know, uh, even among roboticists and then even among the scholars who study robots, the definition of robots are not actually converging. So what I would def define uh, the robot, um, robots usually uh, 
can move and can manifest They've intelligence. They've got to be able to move. Yeah. There are, so mobility. I, I will. Uh, I will point you towards uh, Fiat factories thirty odd years ago, right. packed with robots. Those robots are in cages. They never move. Right. So they they exactly they punch punch holes in metal. Yeah. So uh, th that's a, a pretty difficult spot to mm. discuss because you know the the word robot has been used for uh, quite a long time, like from the era of automation. So, you know, be careful that, you know, I use the term automation. So automation was from like um, like 1970s or 60s, like the, the, the machine that you just mm. uh, mentioned, yeah. Yeah. like uh, the like heavy duty arms mm. in the automobile factory. I mean, they are robots, mm. but you know, we are facing like different types of robots, right? I mean, those kind of robots are not going to be in our home, and then those are not going to be interacting with us. You know, like automation, like heavy-duty robots, or um, those kind of machines. So, well, um, I mean, they yeah. are, uh, you know, like humans are not present. Like, you know. That is changing in factories. They're now developing things called cobots, which mm -hmm. uh, uh, workers are encouraged to interact with. Uh, do you think a definition matters? Uh, well, when it comes to the word robot, it's 100 years and four mm. days old mm. in its popular conception since Carol Chepek's uh, play R.U.R. is mm. now 100 years old from the yeah. 1920s, that he used the Czech word robota, or roboti for plural, mm. meaning serf, mm -hmm. as in servant, in the feudal mm. system. So we have an origin for the term where it was applied specifically to a story about factory workers synthetically formed out of actually bioorganic matter rather than metal. The metal robot predated Carol Chapik and actually occurs after. But the, it, the, it comes with all that baggage that you're talking about, that we have this conception of what the robot is. And I actually think it's very interesting that we don't have a single definition, that actually it's a very slippery term where, I, was, I think I was saying to you earlier, that um, I get asked what I do sometimes and I say I, I research AI and some people say, oh, well, artificial insemination. Mm. <laughs> but you say robot, yeah. they know because they have this literacy in the science fiction of what a robot is. And I've given talks at schools to quite young children. And you say, which robots do you know? And they already know films they shouldn't have ever watched at sort mm. of seven years old. But they know the Terminator and they know, the, you know mm. they even know cyborgs. So they know that distinction as well. So we're fed a diet of what the robot is before any kind of technical definition and that's what's very interesting to me, that even if it's a very slippery term, it can be applied in very many different ways. Now, uh, the, the two extremes of what, what you, you've, uh, you, the two of you have shown us are the, the Amazon robot, which is a purely practical device, right. uh, and uh, the, the, f the furry creatures, mm. where, and, and also the, the, the slightly uncanny valley uh, <coughs> I, I think that the Uncanny Valley is, is not those furry creatures, but uh, uh, the, the the one that's been given Saudi citizenship. So, Sophia, so, Sophia, yeah. Sophia, Sophia. It's very um, it's very subjective. So Uncanny Valley yeah. varies for different people. Um, what does it What does it say that, despite the fact that it seems to me that where robots are really entering our lives is in the Amazon warehouse in a purely pra practical form that we are seeing this whole rash of uh, kind of humanoid robots uh, whose function, to me, at the moment, is pretty unclear. Yes, yeah, so for some people creating robotic entities, uh, there is a line of history that they want to follow, that they see a sort of ex accelerationist view of what the future will be like, and that is also fed by science fiction accounts of we'll walk down the street alongside robots. Mm. So they want to get to that by creating things now that bring us closer to that future, that not quite here yet future. So Sophia is a perfect example of what I call manifested aspiration, that people want this thing to exist. So they make Sophia and pretend that she's more advanced than she actually but is. They're also, they have got uses as a kind of, manifestation of how far artificial intelligence research has come. You want, for instance, yeah, I mean, one of the, 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 the big developments in artificial intelligence has been computer vision, mm. Com a computer that you know, knows the difference between a cat and a dog. And I suppose, almost in PR terms, you build something that looks like a, a human to, to kind of explain that to people. 
In the case of Sophia, it's not so clear that she can do no. that kind of recognition <laughs> right. yeah. at all. So, I mean, I, I leave her to one side mm. for a moment. But yes, yeah, so some of the examples of machine vision, there, there's no robotic form attached to that at all. They're actually using just sensors and just output mm. systems. So it's not apparent that that's key, but you're absolutely right. It, it, it draws more attention if you talk about AI and creativity and you create a robot that can paint mm -hmm. than if you just talked about a program that painted something. So yeah, it, it is about getting eyeballs on the, the story that you want it's to capturing tell. capturing the imagination. Absolutely, and yeah. again, drawing on the science fiction that's so rich and so, so valuable in its own right, but can mislead us to where we are now. Um, in terms of the huge wave of investment that's gone into this area. Do you understand why a lot of that investment does seem to be going into these uh, humanoid uh, mm -hmm. robots? Uh, I, I, I didn't go this year, but I go year after year to CES, the show in Las Vegas, and every year there has been uh, uh, another of these cute humanoid robots. Right. The, 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 the French one, uh, Pepper, uh, has been a, a constant visitor mm -hmm. uh, and seems to be... Uh, I've, I'm beginning to feel sorry for Pepper because she, yeah, she turns up, she gives evidence to that House of Commons Select Committee. Uh, she's quite cute. Uh, she's got a nice voice. And I'm calling her she, you notice. Um, but she still seems to me to be desperate for a proper role. So why is that investment all going there? What, what is driving it? So you think the robot was desperate or the company was desperate? But a or bit of both, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. don't think the robot was desperate, no. Yeah. no. <laughs> so, you know, um, I totally agree with you about um, like the fundamental reasons that the humans want to build a robot that looked like a human, so like Sophia. So people obviously want those kind of robots to exist. So uh, that, that may be, uh, you know, like we may have to go back to like a hu fundamental human desire or something. But the, from practical standpoint, you know, a design matters a lot. So for example, we want to build a robot that can paint. So of course, human arm. So if a robot that looks like a human arm, that may not be necessary, right? So it's not efficient, it's not effective to move around the brushes and the colors and everything. But, you know, robots are interacting with people. And then humans have feelings and then, like, minds, right? So the designs. Like, for example, if the robot that looks like the human mind or the human face or the speaks natural language or um, have a gesture with two arms and stuff like that. So that actually lowers the psychological barriers for people to interact with the robots and then it can increase like positive feelings and to uh, attitudes towards them. So that why is kind of like... Have, why do we need to have positive attitudes to robots? This is an interesting question. Why we uh, don't I don't that? have a positive attitude to... Um, my uh, my washing machine. I, I like it, but I mm -hmm. I don't I don't love it. Uh, I don't want to take it on a date. Yeah. Um, why do we need to have a positive rela relationship with a robot? I want to ask a question: Why not? And then you know, I mean, we are already observing a lot of cases where we don't have like positive attitude or feelings toward the machine. So, for example, you know. Uh, I just want to ask a question to you that your perception toward your washing machine is purely based on the functionality. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, we don't... We, I mean, for we, example... We, we, you know, we never talk, we never, you know... <laughs> yeah, I know. The, the relationship is, is, is going nowhere, I have to tell you. I know. <laughs> okay, I know. Yeah, yeah, that's... I, I'm glad, I'm glad. Well, my, 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 I'm glad my wife's not here because she will say I'm... <laughs> I'm unusually cold and distant towards the washing machine. Yeah. Um, you know, what I'm saying is like the aesthetic uh, aspect or the design aspect. So uh, that actually matters a lot. So it's pretty natural, right? So, I mean, for example, you want to choose a phone, like, mm -hmm. right? And for example, um, like when you, um, like, for example, let's, uh, let's, uh, imagine this kind of situation. So you have an Alexa and then Google Assistant and Apple Siri, right? But, you know, they are all female, but somehow, you know, maybe you, you have noticed that they want to 
um, have like positive attention from you, like maybe, right? So just by having attractive female voice, um, or um, they try to be like festive in their tones and then vocabularies and then sound and something like that. So uh, this is about like how human minds work, and then this is about like how humans interact with machines, and then which is pretty much based on how we interact with each other among humans, right? So from this standpoint, like having a human-like design or appearance for the robots, you know, it, it is a good thing. I mean, in terms of like, um, having so people Amazon is adapt. making a mistake with that robot, you would say, because that robot mm -hmm. does not have. Uh, I think they could do. They could aspect. do better. So, for example, right. you know, um, for example, like the the guy in this photo. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. You can never go back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Um, he doesn't look happy. I mean, like, he looks pretty neutral, I, I know. So what you're telling me is if you painted a smiley face on that, he'd suddenly be happy. <laughs> but, 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 like, outside this example, so for example, you know, uh, there's a robot called Baxter, uh, yeah. which was developed for uh, Cobot, like collaborative robotics. Um, you know, it has, like, two arms and then one display. Um, with cameras. And then this robot was designed uh, to be working alongside humans. Um, so the robot can stop immediately uh, as soon as it recognizes like human touch uh, in, in the vicinity or something like that. But you know, the, what the, f the funny thing is about the robot is um, it has a little two eyes. It constantly showing two eyes and the facial expressions in this dis display, right? So, you know, I mean, it's, it may not be, um, like, directly about the performance, mm. but it's a human mind, right? So by having these two eyes, like, humans may be a little bit more happier or, like, less stressed out or, like, lowering their barriers to interact with the robots. Beth, let's bring you in. I mean, I'm, ju I'm dubious about... Uh, the the need for the, those industrial robots to, to, to look human. But the, the whole point of some of the ones that you've been talking about is that they are, they're, they're called companion robots. Mm. Where's that going? I mean, is that a, um, uh, a useful part? I, I've got, again, doubts about how, how companionable and how um, useful they are. So I, I, I kind of get sense in the audience, someone there gets an idea of where companion robots could be going. There's a sort of like a slight laugh there, but there's, yeah. so, there's so much I want to respond to actually mm. in, in the yeah. comments just made that, uh, I mean, the whole gendered aspect of some of those AI assistants needs to be addressed that you're saying that they're making them more companionable, but they're making them more companionable in a specific gender. Where, and you're talking about the design, but the actual design of the unit that the voice comes out of has nothing to do with anthropomorphism at all. It's usually quite blocky. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting, interesting that we've got this assumption that the future will bring us robots in particular designs and the companionship element uh, can go down, as in my first slide, into the direction that people are assuming we're gonna end up with sexy lady robots in particular and there are people working on the technology for sex robots, and I'm not a sex robots expert by any means, and other people are much better, like Kate Devlin, but I think it's very interesting that this is a part of our imagination, that we will end up again with a form of emotional labor, servitude, sexual labor as well, included in that, through, through this technology, and that I think to a certain extent you're right, we do pattern our technology on things we're already familiar with, but it doesn't have to necessarily be the Android robot. So in, in connecting with our technology through our phones or through our computers, some of the ways in which the data is stored and presented replicates non-computer interfaces. So we have folders and we have the save icon for, for people in my generation and in your generation perhaps, um, the, the save icon being the three and a half inch disc. Most mm -hmm. younger yes. people <laughs> don't recall yeah. uh, saving things so on those discs. what's called skeuomorphism, I forget. I, yeah. I forget yeah. the term, yeah. but yeah, so we use symbols that 
to us, we recognise those mm. as, as and, and that's one argument for saying that robots should be symbolic of things we're familiar with, and that could be the human form. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't really serve always the purpose of the robot, whereas mm. the folder on the computer does serve the purpose of saving things mm. in a different way. So I, I'm skeptical about, and certainly is skeptical when it comes to the Amazon robot. I don't think it would help the person working there to have a smiley face mm. on the robot at all. I don't think there's actually much interaction going on mm. between that gentleman who looks not very happy and the robot. And I think actually he's not very happy, not because there's a robot working there, but because he's being treated like a robot. Mm. And literally, Amazon workers have protested with signs saying, I am not a robot, because mm. they get very few breaks. They have to reach outrageous standards of performance. Mm. And the counter to anthropomorphization of robots is actually robomorphization of humans, mm. that we treat humans more and more like machines and make them replaceable. So that's, that's a deep concern to, my, to me. And I'm not sure actually just adding smiley faces does anything to sort that out. Um, and what? <laughs> <laughs> My fans are here. So. Yeah, yeah, they're fantastic. We're, we're in, a, in a moment, we're going to have a q and I just want to ask you one more, one more thing. Um, have you looked at, uh, th there's, particularly in Japan, there, there is, and you, 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 you kind of mentioned this, there is this idea that uh, in an ageing society, um, uh, the uh, robots could be the answer to, to care in, 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 in home. I mean, I, I, I saw one thing which really horrified me, which was a robot that was going to be, uh, was sold as this will look after people with dementia. Uh, and it, it's a smiley face. And if the person with dementia tells the same story a hundred times, a human might lose their rag. The robot yeah. never will. Um, this, this is kind of worrying stuff, isn't it? Yeah, so I, I raised the question of human dignity, and this is a big question that all societies will have to consider because this is going to affect all societies, that we will end up, because of our increased health uh, conditions, that we will end up with increasingly with ageing populations. And Japan, um, stereotypically, we assume this is the country where it's almost the test case already. We're seeing this happening. They have uh, more social robots in the healthcare system than anywhere else it appears and there's lots of assumptions made about why that is and why Japanese culture is different um, and there's lots of very reductionist arguments about their history of Shinto and Buddhism and actually we also in the so-called West have all these traditions of spirits and, and uh, animated beings in, in equal ways but I think what's very interesting is that for, for some people who are coming out of that culture, and I'm not saying this personally, but I have heard this said by people from the Japanese culture and the Asian culture more widely, there are reasons beyond just the aging population that there's actually concerns about immigration. And talking about the blue collar workers, um, in America, a lot of the blue collar wor workers are more concerned about immigration than robots coming in and automating labor. And that's a narrative that's being pushed from the top. We know in the Trumpian government that they have over there, this is something that's repeated again and again. Again. And it's, so it's not simply that there's an aging population and robots are the answer. There's lots of different narratives and threads and tensions at play that we can't just simply summarize quite often with a sort of weird techno-orientalism that says Japanese people are doing these things because they like spirits. Okay. Um, it's time for some interaction. With, uh, you're not an audience of robots. We've already established that. Uh, and we've got, we've got a question here. And then after that, there's a question there. Good evening. Uh, why are people so worried about robots today, right? We had robots a century ago in the countryside. It did wonderful things for humanity. It freed up a lot of people instead of 80% finding, you know, spending all their time bringing up their food and everything. Now they can do other things and humanity went to the next level. Why do we suddenly worry that it's not gonna happen again? It's a good question. I mean, do we worry? Uh, there, there, there's been a lot of alarmism about jobs, and actually, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the, the economics behind that has been shown to be quite shaky. Um, why do we worry about that? And then, you know, I, I want to re revisit this question, and then I want to revisit the topic of, like, living with robots now. So, because, you know... Uh, it looks like, I mean, to me, like, Beth and I are uh, talking about, like, slightly different things, right? So, I mean, 
I am actually talking about like robots as like inevitable change in our lives. I mean, but not every facet of life. Like, I mean, the, the areas that we can adopt robots. For example, workplaces and the factories and some homes, like lonely people, um, like therapeutic uh, purpose for autistic children, uh, those kind of uh, areas. I mean, we can actually welcome robots and then some designs of the robots and then research on how we interact with robots can actually benefit our lives. But, you know, some um, discussion on adoption of robots in our lives, I mean, sometimes I feel that um, it's like threatening the whole human dignity, right? So, I mean, of course, like it can be like a huge threat to a human dignity and a human existence or something like that. But I think we, we may have to tease out um, the cases, right? So uh, where we can actually use and then benefit from uh, adopting those robots and then uh, other cases that can um, be um, like pretty negative about having the robots. I, 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 I don't, uh, maybe uh, it would be an answer or, yeah. Let's just, or, yeah. Yeah. Quick, a quick word from Beth. Yeah, so we, we have a, a long sceptical history of our relationship with machines and often if you say you're a bit worried about the incoming influx of robots that you're some sort of neo-Luddite because the Luddites rebelled against things like the spinning jenny and threw them in rivers and your example of sort of uh, 100 years ago, what were we dealing with? We weren't really dealing with tractors but... There, there was a period of time where we increasingly saw that we could mechanize farming in particular and reduce the need for human labor. Prior to that, we had horse labor, and we had horses for transport, and we had horses for leisure as well. Um, and now I just sort of quickly want to ask, how many people here own a horse? <laughs> Yeah, so the, we reached peak horse at one point. I was, I'm, we, I'm staying nearby, and there's lots of muse houses. Now, muse houses started as the stabling for horses in the center of towns, and now they're very, very, very expensive properties. So we move on from the horse. We reach peak horse, and where the question is, are we also necessarily reaching peak human? Because physical labor will be automated, but also intellectual labor and emotional labor with the examples of the robots that hack our emotional um, uh, states and do work that we previously thought humans could do. So this is this is the concern, and I don't necessarily fall ultimately down into a neo-Luddite position, but we should have these conversations because you're right, we should talk about where we should and shouldn't use automation and where it's appropriate and where it isn't. But that conversation isn't necessarily being have, had here. It's being have, had at the corporate level or even the state level, and we need to think about who the players in that are. Now... Uh, we had a question in the front. Uh, we've got a microphone coming. Robots aren't self-conscious, at least what we know of so far. But does something which has rights need to be self-conscious? And do you need to be self-conscious in order to have rights? Oh, my goodness. That, <laughs> that is an amazing question. I love it. That's brilliant. That's a, that's a question for you. Okay. You're, you're the only one here. <laughs> Uh, so you're absolutely right. You don't have to be conscious to have rights. Uh, we apply rights to many different things. More recently, we've applied rights to rivers, to mountains, indigenous cultures that respect those uh, geographical forms. We, we, we've accepted that there should be rights applied. We do apply rights to animals who, you know, debates about consciousness in various different forms of the animal kingdom do continue. So it's a good point, but my concern is that we focus on robot rights too soon. Uh, because perhaps someone can program a robot that says, please give me rights, when it's nowhere even near conscious or needing rights, and we ignore the rights of those things and people that require them now. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite concerned about where our attention goes. And I say that as someone who spends a lot of time talking about robots, and I want to carry on talking about robots, but there are other things happening in the world as well. Um, I, I think we've got time for one more question. Have we, have we got a microphone coming? <laughs> Could you Pass that? it on. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, it's been a bit negative about robots, but um, the concept of embodiment and the fact that uh, clearly we're learning quite a lot about how humans work from particularly medical applications of robotic arms. I mean, if you've um, lost, you know, a, a, a limb in, uh, in war, then you know clearly what you really want is a perfectly functioning 
repli replica. Are, are we not learning from robotics how the human uh, haptic skill can be replaced? Yeah, I, I, bef before, before, uh, before this event, we were having a chat and I was talking about having met uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, who gave me a great uh, warning about the, the potential for uh, robots uh, to, to make us obsolete. But he, he, he was using robotic technology in some ways to, to communicate. So um, there is some exciting stuff out there, isn't there, that, yeah, that can augment us. I mean... Well, there is a question about the difference between therapy and therapeutic uses and augmentation. So uh, the applications you're talking about are therape therapeutic uses, and absolutely we should, we should explore technology for all its benefits while bearing in mind where we might take things too far. Augmentation and cyborgism and transhumanism is a whole other discussion about where we want humanity as a whole to end up. But... It would be great to think every single technological use could be applied to therapeutic uses, but I, I spent some time going around an engineering department a year or two back, and they showed me this lower half exoskeleton. And I was like, fantastic, if people you know, who can't walk for various reasons are in wheelchairs, they could use that, they could end up walking. They said, no, well, actually the first commercial use will be in a factory to keep workers standing up for longer. Oh, so we need to think about the ethical implications, even if the technology itself could be applied for good. We need to be pushing for that. And a quick positive thought. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, the, that's why we need robotic uh, ethics. And then, you know, I think um, like lawmakers, the law scholars, um, you know, uh, ethics uh, scholars, they are like really actively engaging in this topic as well with the uh, very active conferences. Um, but in terms of the human rights, um, uh, the robot rights, I, I also agree that it's pretty too soon to uh, discuss uh, that. But, you know, um, in the end, I think like robot rights um, have to be about the human rights. So uh, the, by treating robots badly, uh, you know, humans feel something bad and then it can be extended to uh, how they treat human, other humans. I mean, that is a kind of like a threat to our human rights as well. So, you know, I mean, I think it's, a, it's good to think about robot rights, but, you know, human rights should be at the center of that discussion as well in the long run. Well, we've run out of time. Can I make the point? I am the only person on stage, as far as I know, who is augmented. I actually had a chip inserted in me four years ago to get into an office block in Sweden uh, where they were talking about uh, giving everybody a chip uh, instead of a pass. So I am the only part robot on the stage. But... Um, uh, as far as you as know. As far as I know, as far as I know. Um, thank you, it's been a fascinating discussion. We could go on for hours, but I think there are drinks out there, and um, I wouldn't like to keep people back from them. So thank you very much to our panel.